So thank you, Dr. I. Thank Dr. Perman for inviting me. He always gives me all these great topics that no one cares about because we've heard all this morning that the new drugs are going to replace everything. So this was the title that I was given, FCR, BR, when and how to use. And it reminded me that two years ago I stood up here and um, we debated BR versus FCR. I think pretty soon, uh, if not right now, it's going to go the, the realm of the RCVP versus RCHOP debate in large cell, if it, in, in low-grade lymphoma. It got uh, blown out of the water by, by other things, and so that's where we face this. So I think what the question really is, is there still a role for chemoimmunotherapy for in treatment of CLL, or is everyone going to get novel agents up front? And so my goal in the next uh, short time is to sort of be a dinosaur and say, today we still need these agents and they have a role. Those are my disclosures. Um, so the underlying assumption is always chemo is bad and novel agents are good and we should, everyone should get novel agents. But as you've heard, novel agents have their own toxicities. Chemotherapy has toxicities we're very comfortable with. And so, uh, you know, we have to be careful that we can, uh, that we're able to maintain adequate outcomes uh, with less toxicity before we throw chemotherapy out uh, out of the way. And we have to be very careful that we decide that it's not everyone with CLL, but what age group, what uh, their performance status is, and what our outcomes are. Is it response rate? Is it PFS? PFS and CLL has never meant much of anything. Um, overall survival is really what we want to get, but that takes too long, so sometimes we cheat and look at PFS, or MRD maybe. And we really want to look at quality of life as the patients are mostly in their late 60s and 70s and 80s and that we're not hurting these patients. And also we don't want to burn bridges so that we have treatments uh, to, um, uh, to come uh, after our initial th uh, therapy. So uh, Dr. Furman showed you this slide. And again, it's not that we're doing so much better. It's that uh, it's, a, it's a selection bias. He also showed you this slide, FCR from the famed MD Anderson 300. And, um, I would just point out that at 10 years, a lot of patients have not needed a second treatment. And of course, if you're mutated, you do better. And you say, well, you know, FCR may be overkill for those patients, but, you know, those patients are largely doing well, many never needing another treatment 10 or years or more out. Uh, we still have problems with the unmutated and certainly the 17 Ps and 11 Q minuses. And uh, this just shows the same thing with the FCR data. I'm not going to belabor that. And that we have new genetics coming. So we're going to parse these, these groups out uh, more than we do today, but it's not quite there yet. So this is less than two years ago. This is ASH 2013, Michael Halleck's slide on how he approaches uh, CLL. And basically, you need treatment or you don't. If you do need treatment, you either go, go, you're a good marathon runner, you get FCR. If you have 17P, you get allo transplant, and you got chlorambucil with some anti-CD20. If you were uh, older and frailer, the so-called slow-go people, and you can look at the slow-go 17P deleted, and you're looking at things we don't even want to think about. And now, less than two years later, we're going to talk about it, uh, or I'm going to talk about whether those things matter. Uh, but right now, I would say FCR or BR, and we'll talk about chlorambucil. <clears throat> what we do agree on um, is that in deletion 17P, I don't think these things matter, and ibrutinib is clearly the winner in 17P. That was the discussion this morning. So I'm not going to try to defend the chemoimmunotherapy in 17P deleted CLL. But for everybody else, I think there's a role. So I think immunochemotherapy in non deletion 17P has high response rates. We can handle it. We're very comfortable with these agents, and they're durable, not even mentioning anti-CD20 maintenance, where there were two kind of muddy abstracts at Ash last year suggesting we might do better with adding that on. And patients can get treated with all the novel agents once they uh, progress after initial chemoimmunotherapy. And cost in terms of toxicity, but dollars is also an issue. This just shows you the CLL8 German study, FCR in the green. Forget about the blue, that's FC. But again, just shows you that FCR works very well, um, uh, and patients have durable uh, uh, remissions and overall survival. And again, I'm not going to belabor this, but again, 17 Ps don't do well. Uh, unmutateds don't do well, so we still have to do better with those. 
but as of today, chemoimmunotherapy still gets several years of remission before uh, these patients need something else. I would hope that we'll get rid of chemoimmunotherapy for those patients, but when you look at the, the unmutated, low-risk patients who do need treatment, it's going to be hard to improve on those durabilities for six months of chemotherapy. So FCR or BR, this recaps the debate, and this is for the marathon runners. So these are patients without 17P, good uh, uh, physical fitness, SEER score less than 6, creatinine clearance greater than 70. So you're talking about a relatively well-defined population already, randomized FCR and BR. And the interpretation of this by the authors was that FCR wins because the progression-free survival is longer, CR rates higher, and MRD is achieved more often. But it comes at a cost. The toxicity is higher treatment-related mortality, um, higher infections, higher neutropenia. And look at the infections for the older patients. It's, it's uh, quite significant. And when you look at the results, you know, that's not a huge difference in PFS. There's no difference in overall survival. And the PFS benefit was not seen in the older patients with SEER scores between 3 and 6 uh, and uh, uh, favorable uh, immunoglobulin genes. So now we're really saying FCR is only in the under 65 SEER score 0 to 2 with bad germ, uh, unmutated IGVH. So for those patients, maybe we use FCR. Uh, for everybody else, I would use BR. Uh, it's applicable to more patients. There's a wider age range, performance status. I don't worry so much about renal function. I don't worry much about exacerbating hemolytic anemia. Uh, it's easier on the patients. I can get this into most patients with CLL. Um, there seems to be less uh, MDS-AML therapy-related myeloid neoplasia. There's fewer late infections. Uh, and uh, we're more comfortable administering uh, later lines of therapy. And certainly if we're going to combine this, as you saw, the BR plus ibrutinib data that Dr. Rai uh, uh, mentioned earlier, that it's a better platform for uh, novel agent combination. <coughs> Excuse me. So I would say we filled out some of the boxes here. We take ibrutinib for the 17 Ps, uh, and I do BR mostly for my go-go patients, uh, with a few exceptions, and then we'll talk about the older patients. Uh, as I say, I use BR. Uh, I'll show you the chlorambucil uh, data, and it's, it's good, and I use it in the 80-year-old frail patients, but there's, most of the patients, I think, can get BR. Uh, whether the new anti-CD20s are going to make the chlorambucil combos more attractive, I think uh, there's evidence that that's the case from the CLL11 trial, which I think was shown earlier, but it's the chlorambucil with no antibody, rituximab, or obinutuzumab and obinutuzumab was the winner, except the devil's already always in the details. Remember that the obinutuzumab was given more frequently at a higher dose, and so as given, it's better, but if it's really a better antibody that can be extrapolated to other settings, I think remains to be seen. There's the little devil there. Yep, devil's always in the details. Uh, but nonetheless, um, the uh, obinutuzumab uh, obinutuzumab arm clearly did better than the rituximab arm. The chlorambucil arm is not shown, but it was around uh, between six and nine months median PFS. Higher response rate, the obinutuzumab, higher MRD in the bone marrow and the blood. So as given, that's better, and that's the approved dosing. And as Dr. Rai mentioned, it's approved with chlorambucil, not as a single agent. And the role of chlorambucil may be under debate, but right now uh, it is certainly an active drug, and that's a combination. So I think it remains to be seen in the older, frailer patients whether uh, chlorambucil with some new antibody uh, or antibody alone uh, might, might be worthwhile, or will the novel agents be there? Um, so I really said that. So when you think about initial therapy, it's all about age, comorbidities, uh, 17P deletion, and hopefully more uh, molecular markers as they come along choose your regimen, and you have your goals in terms of the patient for their toxicity, quality of life, and what you expect from the outcome. And you balance all of that to try to make your decision. So how do I select it? I really mentioned this already. Ibrutinib, if you're 17P deleted, except if you are on full anticoagulation, have underlying AFib, where I'm concerned about that. I might use Idelalisib, and as uh, Dr. Kutray mentioned, we're sort of looking forward to Venetoclax, the name for ABT199, which hopefully will come in the near future. 
So FCR is fairly limited in my practice, young healthy patient with sort of bad disease, basically unmutated immunoglobulin uh, genes uh, or deletion 11Q or both, or just a really rapid pace of disease where I think this, this patient needs uh, a little more intensive therapy. Uh, but I am concerned about the short and long-term toxicity of FCR. BR I use most commonly, and chloramicil for anti-CD20 in the frail, truly elderly patient who I don't think can uh, get much else. Uh, in terms of toxicity, we always worry about um, uh, myelosuppression and, and long-term bone marrow effects, and I think those are higher with the fludarabine and FCR. Uh, older patients don't tolerate fludarabine. I rarely use it over age 65. Uh, and uh, we worry about the immunosuppression. You have to put them on prophylactic antibiotics. It becomes much more complicated than BR. Um, uh, bendamustine, I don't like to use with allopurinol because of the concerns for uh, hypersensitivity, so I try not to, uh, and tumor lysis is not very common, so I tend not to do that. Uh, here's the ofatumumab uh, monotherapy data that got it approved, and I say that only because that then served as the basis for the Resonate trial, the ibrutinib study, which uh, I think we've already heard, and, and uh, I won't belabor the point, except that the overall survival is not that high, and the argument was, well, there was crossover, but not everyone crossed over. So again, even here, uh, we have to think about long-term survival. And there are some c concerns about the new drugs, lenalidomide. We didn't hear much about it. Uh, Dr. Catre mentioned a little bit, but, you know, in the early CLL, uh, uh, elderly CLL trial, uh, there were excess deaths in that arm that got closed. Um, we heard about the concern about Richter's transformation CLL in the later patients who have been heavily pretreated. We don't know what's going to happen to patients, and in theory, you might select a bad clone, and patients could do well for a long time, but then when they progress on ibrutinib, not do well at all, and we may actually not be helping them in the long term. Uh, the longer patients are on ibrutinib, the less that appears to be an issue in the upfront setting, but it's still a clearly an issue. And in mantle cell, we see the same result. Mantle cell lymphoma patients who uh, progress after ibrutinib uh, do miserably. Overall survival measured in about three months. Uh, so are we selecting for uh, rapid, high uh, uh, proliferative rate patients? Um, Idelalisib, autoimmune toxicities are difficult. Hopefully these new drugs, uh, new uh, ones that, that Steve talked about, will We'll get around that. And venetoclax, we don't know anything about long-term toxicities, about, you know, preventing BCL2 function. And tumor lysis is manageable, but it's not uh, easy. So all of these have their own unique uh, concerns. Um, this is just the CLL data survival on, on the left panel after ibrutinib failure and uh, mantle cell showing similarly poor results. So it's not just CLL microclones. It's in mantle cell as well. I don't want to spend too much time on cost, but, you know, these are costly agents, and if you combine them, they, we're talking about break the bank, and, you know, six cycles of BR, uh, you know, I put the calculations there, um, you know, maybe $50,000, you can, uh, I just for fun, I looked uh, online, and I could buy a um, bendamustine uh, from some pharmacy in Asia and get it mailed to me for about $100 for enough to give me a six-month supply. So, and it comes off patent in about a, two years. So bendamustine cost will go way down. Um, so I think, you know, we have to start thinking about this. And if I can get four, five, eight, ten years out of BR and start my ibrutinib later, then maybe that's what, where we should be going. Uh, I think we're all excited about the ongoing clinical trials. We encourage participation in these. We participate in them and accrue pretty well to them. Uh, it's either uh, BR, in the older patients, BR versus uh, ibrutinib or ibrutinib bar, and in the younger patients, it's FCR versus ibrutinib bar. These are really important studies um, uh, going forward. And I just want to say we need to figure out the best way to use ibrutinib uh, and these other agents. So, you know, we give more intensive chemotherapy. We always show slides like this, oh, we're dropping the tumor load, and as it grows back, we get a longer PFS before it becomes clinically manageable, uh, clinically evident. So when's the best time to start? Well, we could start ibrutinib at the start, like BR plus ibrutinib. It'll clearly be better as long as you treat forever. It's clearly going to be better because you're giving two treatments as opposed to just BR followed by ibrutinib sequentially. And what we don't know is when should we start. Maybe at maximum response. At the end of BR, maybe that's the time to start ibrutinib, so we save six months of that. Maybe it's when it just starts to come back molecularly, 
or maybe we should wait and do second treatment. And maybe we get to the same place with all of those, we just don't know. And again, cost and toxicity and dollars makes a big difference if I'm starting ibrutinib on average five or eight years later uh, than if I start on day one. Um, so in the potential strategies, I think, you know, we can use chemotherapy to cytoreduce patients. Uh, if we started venetoclax, ABT199, at that point, we probably wouldn't have tumor lysis. So that would be a strategy. We could start ibrutinib as a consolidation. And then um, maybe wait and do MRD stop and wait for MRD uh, to develop and molecularly uh, follow patients once we restart treatment trying to get the best strategy with the least side effects and the least morbidity uh, and best quality of life. And then uh, we're all excited about CAR T-cell, immune therapies work in CLL, and so one can imagine getting to a minimal disease state and coming in at that point, and maybe, you know, the dream of curing CLL will be there. So I've run through that pretty quickly, but hopefully got us back on time. And um, so CLL often does not need to be treatment, but for patients with rapid uh, bad prognosis, it is a real cancer. Currently not curable. We really individualize treatments. And I think that chemotherapy with an anti-CD20 antibody is still reasonable treatment for many patients and uh, buys us several years of remission. And then we can come in with novel agents at that point. And ultimately, we really have to look at are we improving survival for our patients.